utilitarianism is canonically thought to be a normative theory. That is, a moral theory that tells us how we ought to act. But some can also view utilitarianism as a descriptive theory of morality. That is, as a theory that describes how we act, explaining the state of affairs regarding morality. When one takes the descriptive approach, morality is essentially considered as an emergent phenomenon due to human existence. One could think about it like some physical law that could possibly be captured by some principles. In this video we will give an argument in favour of considering morality as descriptively guided by the utilitarian principle. The argument we will shortly give is based on abductive logic, a form of logic where the premises should provide support for the truth of a conclusion, but they do not guarantee its truth. This form of reasoning is sometimes also called inference to the best explanation. Ok, let's give the argument. As humans, we are living organisms, a life form, and as such, we reproduce. Indeed, reproduction is a fundamental feature of all known life. But some could even be a bit bolder and claim that not only do life forms reproduce, but if you leave them alone, they will tend to maximize their population. Of course, the more members of a species, the higher the chance that in the reproduction cycle, new evolutionary traits that facilitate survival will occur. Take the series of experiments performed by John Calhoun on rodent populations. In an effort to study the natural limits on population growth, Calhoun created paradise environments for rodents so that they could reproduce in peace. What he observed was that the mice quickly increased their population to the physical limits imposed by their environment. In turn, the very high density of the enclosed population caused the rodents extreme stress, which led to a breakdown in social structure and in normal social behaviour. Aggressiveness was increased and the young were often wounded, ultimately resulting in the demise of a population. For our purposes, what is interesting to note regarding Calhoun's experiments is that, in their utopia, the rodents started maximizing their number with no regards towards the overall well-being of their population, as if they were guided by a biological law. They simply reproduced as much as possible, with no forethought, acting as if their collective goal was the maximization of members of their species or the maximization of their collective evolutionary potential slash genetic survivability. The well-being of the individuals that comprise the population emerges as of secondary importance. A similar phenomenon can be observed with bacteria placed in a limited environment, where after the so-called log stage, the stage where each bacteria reproduces by doubling, there is a stationary stage in which growth rate and death rate are equal given the constraints of the habitat. One could hypothesize that this tendency to maximize the population towards the carrying capacity of the environment is an underlying mechanism at the basis of all known life. Except, possibly, from one life form in particular, human beings. Humans seem to be aware, at least to an extent, of the potential suffering caused by overpopulation and crowding. For instance, the notorious one-child policy, instituted for a time in China, aimed to limit the number of births for economic, logistic and environmental reasons. Furthermore, even at the individual level, we can observe some behaviours that go counter to population maximization. Humans that have spent more time in education appear to display a drop in their fertility rates. This is the opposite we would expect from any other animal. If an individual of a species is at a higher level of an advantageous trait hierarchy, we would expect him to be more desirable, thus reproducing more, not less. Instead, the growth rate of human population has been declining since the 1970s. It appears that we aren't racing to hit the carrying capacity of our environment. Also, humans are the only known life form that have a voluntary human extinction movement that, among other things, states that a decrease in the human population would prevent a significant amount of human caused suffering. We are left with a conundrum. 
On one hand, it seems like all life forms act to maximize the number of individuals of their species. And on the other hand, humans exhibit behaviors that go counter to this tendency. Possibly the most straightforward explanation is that we have what we might call reason, the capacity of consciously applying logic to seek truth and draw forward-looking conclusions from new or existing information. This differentiates us from other life forms. Thus, we claim that the uniqueness of our capacity to reason explains the unique behaviors we exhibit. The inference we make is that what is actually going on under the hood is that reason modifies the objective of our existent maximization procedure. It's not that we as a life form do not have the underlying maximization mechanism that all other life forms have. Rather, the underlying mechanism is changed by the presence of reason. It's still a maximization procedure, but now, instead of a number of individuals, we are maximizing for the well-being of the species. A simple way to think about it is that, given a life form, if we start adding reason to it, it will gradually alter the objective of its maximization procedure in a continuous manner. This conjecture would explain many of our counter-tendencies. Firstly, as we have argued elsewhere, when humans have to decide policy, they come up with remarkably utilitarian norms and laws. Policy is where we manifest our overarching goals as a species, and it's also the place where morality is decided through a reasoned procedure. In line with our inference, we observe policies that tend to aim at the maximization of well-being rather than at the maximization of population. Second, the lower fertility rates of more educated people would be due to the time spent cultivating their reason, making them more concerned with overall well-being than with population maximization. Third, antinatalist movements would now fit the descriptive picture of human behavior, since if their members are assuming that a life on average is comprised more of suffering than anything else, then it would make perfect sense, from a utilitarian perspective, to forego the evolutionary mechanism of reproduction. Our reasoning would also help explain why the global growth rate has been declining since the 1970s, without us ever reaching the carrying capacity of our environment. With this, we have essentially given our abductive argument for utilitarianism as a descriptive theory of morality. It has some appeals, but now let's look at some possible drawbacks. As a starter, there seems to be many cases where humans don't act in accordance to the utility principle. Rather, they follow religious dogmas, biological biases, or something else. So how can utilitarianism as a descriptive theory be true? There are many observations that don't fall in line with the conjecture. One of the possible rationales we may advance is that not everybody has the luxury of developing their reason, and that there are many situations where reason is hard to apply. For instance, when one is on a very short time constraint or in a difficult situation. As we have said, we hypothesize that the descriptive utilitarian tendencies are tied to the capacity to reason. So it should not be surprising that there are cases in which they don't emerge, since there are many cases where reason is not applied in the decision-making process. Now one could say, okay, you say reason is the ingredient that shifts our optimization procedure towards well-being. But what about the moral theories of Kant or John Rawls? Surely reason is not missing in their thought. How come they don't propose a utilitarian theory of morality? An amusing way to defend our hypothesis from this ulterior objection is to claim that both Kant and Rawls were actually utilitarians. With regards to Immanuel Kant, there is precedent in the literature to support this claim. Richard Mervyn Hare tells us that Kant's formal theory can certainly be interpreted in a way that allows him, perhaps even requires him, to be one kind of utilitarian. While for Rawls, some have argued that his own reasons, assumptions, and the many theoretical devices he employs demonstrably imply that the representative parties in the so-called original position will choose utilitarianism as a moral theory. On the other hand, maybe a more convincing answer to this question is to say that Kant and Rawls gave a normative theory. They were not writing policy. 
They write on what in their mind ought to be in an ideal world. Yes, when and if they act according to their theories, they are using reason. But they are using it to post-rationalize societal norms, ingrained in their subconscious by their cultural upbringing. For Kant, this view is quite popular. Nowadays, in fact, few would defend his moral conclusions on subjects such as capital punishment, masturbation, women, lying, etc. etc. While the claim that Rawls is post-rationalizing his min-max principle is supported by Joshua Greeney in his book Moral Tribes, that I highly suggest, by the way. At the end of the day, even if not perfectly matching empirical observations, the hypothesis we presented in this video could be a step in an interesting direction. Surely there are other pieces of the puzzle to uncover. If you think you're onto something, post it in the comment section. Lots of eudaimonia to all.